Having the wrong exercise order is a mistake I often see in people's programs and it can limit how many gains you make. Here's how to fix it. Welcome back, soon to be Dr. Milo Wolf here with Wolf Coaching, and today we're talking about exercise order and how to optimize it for your gains. I recently changed my mind about exercise order. Previously, here's what I thought were the ironclad principles of exercise order. Whatever you train first in a session gets the best training effect, and that's where you make the most gains. My thought process was, since you're doing that exercise with the least fatigue, you're freshest, you're going into a session, you don't have any fatigue, that's what would then get the best training effect because you perform your best and thus you get the best stimulus. So for hypertrophy, I thought you would want to start sessions with exercises targeting the muscle groups that you most cared about or you were prioritizing the most. If you really wanted to grow bigger biceps, you would start with curls, for example. Equally, if you wanted overall physique development, a good rule of thumb was to start with compounds within the session. That way, the most important exercises, the compound exercises that grow most of the muscle around your body, would be placed first, get the best training effect with high performance, and thus you would grow the most muscle overall for overall physique development. For strength, I felt the same thing applied. So whatever you trained first within the session saw the greatest strength gains versus, for example, an exercise that you did as the fourth exercise within that session. However, it turns out I was wrong. This is where a meta-analysis by Nunes and colleagues from 2020 comes in. They analyzed 11 studies. They looked at the effect of exercise order on both muscle hypertrophy and muscle strength. Shockingly, for muscle growth, they didn't find a difference. In other words, no matter the exercise order that you used, you saw basically the same growth. This is kind of good news. It means that you don't need to worry about exercise order too much, and you can focus your attention on things like training close enough to failure, and other stuff. With that being said, even though there was no effect found within this analysis, there's a few things I would still recommend paying attention to. Number one, I would try not to put all of the exercises that are quite systemically fatiguing, in other words, make you quite out of breath or have a lot of stabilizer muscle groups, one after the other. For example, if you're doing three exercises, the squat, the split squat, and the leg curl, generally, I would try to order them as squat, then leg curl, and then split squat, rather than squat, then split squat, and then leg curl. Because if you go into split squats having just squatted, oftentimes what'll happen is you're so systemically fatigued, you're out of breath, certain muscle groups like your lower back can still be quite pumped and fatigued, that your performance often takes a hit. Or if your performance doesn't take a hit, you often have to take longer rest times, which overall can reduce the time efficiency of your session. Why is reduced performance a big deal for hypertrophy? Well, if you recall from my rest time video, Volume load across a session, how much weight you lift for how many reps for how many sets, does seem to play at least a bit of a role for hypertrophy. And so in other words, if you're going from squats to split squats without really resting much between exercises, the same kind of finding applies. By not resting for enough time between two similar exercises, you may be reducing performance, which can in turn reduce hypertrophy. So putting an exercise that is less systemically fatiguing between two highly systemically fatiguing exercises, like the squat and the split squat, can often help either improve the time efficiency of your sessions or potentially just result in better stimulus for muscle growth overall, in all likelihood, although this is a bit speculative. The second thing I want to point out is the dilemma of either consolidating or spreading out exercises for the same rough muscle group. Consolidating exercises within a session for the same muscle groups means placing exercises that train similar muscle groups sequentially or back to back. So for example, if in a given session you're doing both a bench press and a dumbbell fly, doing them sequentially would be consolidating them. So starting with a bench and then going into dumbbell flies. On the other hand, spreading them out would mean, for example, doing the bench press and then doing, for example, a row, and then you follow it up with a dumbbell fly. So spreading out the chest work a little bit across the session. Consolidating and spreading out the exercises for the same muscle groups across the session have different benefits. When you're consolidating, you may find that you need fewer warm-ups for that second exercise because the target muscle group and the target joints are already quite warm and you can get away with doing just one or two warm-up sets. And this can lead to greater time efficiency. On the other hand, by spreading out exercises, so not doing all your chest work within a session back to back, you would potentially be able to perform better on each exercise, accumulating a greater volume load across the session. And as I mentioned earlier, this may or may not be better for hypertrophy. The third thing to pay attention to as far as exercise order is concerned for hypertrophy is potential mobility enhancements. What I mean by this is that certain exercises can essentially double as a dynamic warm-up, increasing your mobility before going into another exercise that benefits from increased flexibility and mobility. For example, let's say you're about to do some squats. By doing calf raises right before your squats, 
you are essentially using calf raises as a dynamic warm-up for your squat. And so while you might want to do squats before calf raises on principle, because you care more about your quads than your calves, you may also find that doing your calf raises before allows you to be a bit more flexible in your ankles, go a bit deeper in your squat, get a better stretch in your quads, and because getting a good stretch under tension during lifting is really important for growth, as I explained in this video here, that might actually lead to more hypertrophy for the quads. The final thing I would pay attention to is something I call fatigue contamination. Let's say you're doing a full body split. On Tuesdays, you do lateral raises and squats in the same session. What you might find is that if you do lateral raises after your squats, your lateral raises kind of suck. You're able to lift way less weight than usual and you get less of a pump in your side delts than usual. However, if you did lateral raises before your squats, oftentimes you'll find that your squats don't suffer at all and you get a great side delt stimulus. And so in this case, in order to maximize stimulus across the session, you might actually wanna place isolation exercises before bigger, more psychologically and systemically fatiguing exercises within a session. This predominantly applies to full body splits, but you get the idea. Importantly, I wouldn't do this when the target muscle group for the isolation exercise is also involved in a later compound exercise. So for example, I wouldn't do leg extensions right before squats, because that will negatively impact your performance on squats. And unless you're trying to pre-exhaust or trying to superset, on principle, it's not a super good idea. The one caveat to this idea of preventing fatigue contamination is potential psychological considerations. I've actually tried this extensively and I've tried this with many of my clients. And sometimes doing too much work before a psychologically demanding exercise, quote unquote, like the squat, can just make it hard to get started with a squat or hard to really get into squats fully and put your full effort into it. And so if you've been trying to do, for example, ladder raises before your squats to avoid that fatigue contamination, you may find that by doing squats first, actually, sure, your ladder raises are worse, but your squats are also a lot easier to get through. Now that we've talked about hypertrophy, let's move on to strength. In this analysis, they showed that whatever you train first seems to get the best training effect for strength. So if you train multi-joint exercises first, you'll see greater gains in multi-joint exercise strength than if you train single joint exercise first and vice versa. So if you start sessions with isolation exercises, you'll see better strength gains in those exercises than if you'd done them second after the compound exercises. As an example, if you start your session with a bench press followed by dumbbell flies, you'll gain more strength in the bench than if you did dumbbell flies followed by bench press. And the opposite applies too. What does this mean? Well, here are a few points. First, start a session with the exercises you care about the most. For example, if you have a lagging lift that you really want to improve, it's probably wise to start most of your sessions that contain that lift with that lift. It'll probably help because you're freshest at that point and you're able to lift the most weight, which for strength seems to be important. The second point, this is a bit more speculative, but for powerlifters or for weightlifters, this might be a bit more important. The fatigue patterns of different exercise orders might be specific. Let's say you're a powerlifter, for example. You know for a fact that in any competition, you'll be squatting first, benching second, and deadlifting last. In order to get some potential fatigue resistance adaptations, you may want to do most of your sessions that contain, say, the squat and the bench, starting with the squat followed by the bench essentially mimicking the order of exercises within a powerlifting competition. This one is speculative, but there might be a case where by doing this, you're able to accrue some fatigue resistance adaptations that make it so that by the time you get to meet day, you're performing a little bit better on your bench and deadlift than you would otherwise have been. Point number three, I mentioned fatigue contamination earlier, whereby fatigue from one exercise bleeds into the next, which reduces performance on that next exercise. This likely plays more of a role for strength than for hypertrophy. While there is a potential role of volume load or how you perform across a session for hypertrophy, there is definitely a role of how much you lift within a session for strength adaptations. In other words, if you're trying to improve your maximum strength, like your wonder max strength for a powerlifter, being able to lift as much as possible on each of your sets for the squat, bench, and deadlift directly leads to more strength gains than if you lifted less. Lifting heavier for a powerlifter is really good for strength gains. This effect is definitely more important for the main lifts than for the accessory lifts, because then specificity decreases a lot. But for powerlifters and for strength athletes, fatigue contamination is a big deal. As a slight continuation of this, as I mentioned earlier, you have the option of consolidating exercises, for example, doing your squat, followed by your leg press if you're a powerlifter, or spreading them out, for example, doing your squat, then doing your bench, and then doing your leg press. For a powerlifter, as a continuation of the previous point, spreading them out is definitely better because it reduces contamination of fatigue from one exercise to the next. And so if you split up your squat and your leg press by having bench in the middle, the fatigue from squats will bleed over to a lesser extent into your leg press, allowing you to lift more. And as I mentioned earlier, 
lifting more weight on the bar is pretty important for powerlifters and for strength athletes more broadly who are concerned about maximum strength. That being said, spreading out exercises is a little bit less time efficient because you need to warm up a little bit more. But to be honest, if you're a powerlifter, for example, you're already in the gym for like six hours doing four sets and talking between sets for about half an hour each. So this isn't really a consideration for you to begin with. So enough rambling. What are the takeaways from all this? Let's start with muscle growth. For muscle growth, I would generally sequence exercises to avoid systemic fatigue spilling over from one exercise into the next. As I mentioned earlier, I would prefer sequencing the squat into the leg curl, followed by the split squat, the squat and the split squat being the highly systemically fatiguing exercises and the leg curl being the less systemically fatiguing exercise, rather than doing two systemically fatiguing exercises back to back, like for example, the squat into the split squat, followed by the leg curl. Number two, I would generally recommend for hypertrophy, spreading out the exercises over a session as much as possible. So for example, instead of doing bench press followed by dumbbell thighs, followed by rows, followed by curls for your arms. I would do bench press, followed by rows. So you have an exercise gap, followed by dumbbell flies, followed by curls. And so between two exercises for similar muscle groups, you have at least an exercise gap between those to maximize performance within each exercise and to get a greater volume load across the session. Number three, consider doing some isolation work before bigger compound exercises, if it will benefit your mobility. For example, doing calf raises before a squat can enhance your ability to go deeper, get longer muscle lengths for your quads, and thus grow more muscle in both your quads and your calves, because now you're doing calf raises before squats. Which leads me into number four, fatigue contamination. Especially for full body sessions, I would generally recommend doing smaller isolation work that won't interfere with the bigger compound work later on first in the session. If, for example, you're doing lateral raises and squats in the same session, I would generally recommend trying doing lateral raises before squats and see how that impacts your performance on squats and on lateral raises. In all likelihood, it will favorably impact it and potentially give you more growth. Now, for strength. Generally, start a session with the exercises you care about most in terms of strength. Number two, it may make sense to order exercises as you will be exposed to them during a competition. This may allow you, and this is speculation, to be a bit more fatigue resistant when it comes to competition. Because we want to minimize fatigue going into any given competition exercise for strength, spreading out exercises for the same muscle groups across a session is the clear winner because it allows you to lift more on each exercise and thus have potentially greater strength gains. That's the video. If you liked the video, please consider liking, comment, subscribing. It really helps out the channel. And I'll see you guys in that next one. Peace. Kitty, don't make me catch it, you right the fuck now. I will fucking do it. You've been meowing a whole lot, you've been talking all that shit, you feel me? Kitty, yeah, that's right, run away, bitch. Yeah, that's right, it's time for the cat check. You wanna escape so bad, but I won't let you. We are best friends, we are bound. Okay, bye.